She'll be the moderator for our panel. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Lori. And uh, I'm delighted to be here for our panels on GPS, drones, technology, and the Fourth Amendment. Once upon a time, police officers' investigative tactics were limited by what they could see through the naked eye. Today's, today, the sky's the limit, uh, literally. Law enforcement officers are aided by observation from unmanned drones patrolling the sky, as we'll experience today. Uh, global positioning systems, GPS devices, which use satellite technology to track a person's location. Thermal imaging devices that can see through walls and detect heat. Facial recognition devices that can trace a person and track a person throughout the city. And those are just the devices and technology, of course, that we're aware of. Uh, simply by using everyday technology, such as cell phones, computers, and cars, and going out in public, individuals are exposing all aspects of their life to the government. For example, an ACLU report recently concluded that law enforcement agencies track cell phones so frequently that cell phone companies have prepared manuals for the law enforcement agencies, explaining what data they collect and describing the price rates for providing those to police agencies. Necessary evil, just necessary, just evil. This panel explores those questions in the context of the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution, which guarantees individuals' rights of privacy by ensuring that the government does not unreasonably search and seize. Of course, the Fourth Amendment was framed and adopted during a time when the kinds of investigative devices and technology available today were the stuff of science fiction. And while over the years, the court has had the occasion to consider various technological advances, excuse me, like wiretapping or pen registers, it's fair to say that the pace and scope of sophistication of technological change will pose a huge challenge to the court in the coming years. More specifically, technological devices raise two fundamental Fourth Amendment questions. Are the use of this technology even a search and seizure under the Fourth Amendment? An issue, of course, that the Supreme Court considered in its most recent pronouncement this year in the case of United States versus Jones. And if the devices do constitute a search and seizure, when is it reasonable to use such devices? To start exploring these issues, let me introduce our illustrious and wonderful panel. Each panelist will speak for no more than 10 minutes on the issues relevant to their expertise. I'll then ask them some questions and invite your questions. So to start with, we have the Honorable Judge um, Alice Hill who began her illustrious career at the U.S. Attorney's Office. She was a chief of the major fraud section at the U.S. Attorney's Office in L.A. and was involved in the prosecution of Charles Keating. 
Uh, she then went on the bench for 13 years in Los Angeles, served as a judge, retired from the bench, and now serves as um, the counselor, senior counselor to Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano. Our next panelist will be... <laughs> Chief Judge, uh, I'm sorry, Chief William McSweeney, a native Californian, native Los Angelino, who attended the University of Colorado and California State University at Northridge. He began his law enforcement career in 1974. Actually, I probably should use dates, right? We, at the age of two. Um, <laughs> he um, then was promoted by Sheriff Baca to, uh, to the division chief of the LA, Sheriff's Depart LA County Sheriff's Department. And in, since 2010, Chief McSweeney assumed command of the detective division there and has been responsible for divisions such as Narcotics Division, Homicide Bureau, Special Victims Bureau, Commercial Crimes Bureau, Major Crimes Bureau, and Task Force for Regional Auto Theft Prevention. So we're very happy he had the time to come and serve on our panel. Panelist needs no introduction to you all. As Lori said, she's substituting in for David Sklansky, but I can't resist saying some wonderful words about her, of course. Um, as, as you know, she's an extraordinary teacher, uh, her, a prolific, exemplary scholar that's uh, sought by all news agencies and, by, um, and is in tremendous demand. She's um, my idol. Wonder Woman at the Law School, uh, the Energizer Bunny, Lori Levinson. We <laughs> didn't have enough to do today, so was so gracious to, ser to uh, stand in for David Sklansky. Uh, Sean Kennedy, our final, last but not least speaker, is our homegrown hero, receiving an undergraduate degree from Lo Loyola Marymount University and a JD from Loyola Law School. He's, uh, in 1992, joined the trial unit of the Federal Public Defenders, he has argued capital appeals in the California Supreme Court, the Ninth Circuit, and the United States Supreme Court. And in 2006, the Ninth Circuit appointed him the federal public defender for the Central District of California, where he served for a four-year term. So we're going to start the panel um, by asking Lori to come and set the stage a little bit um, by actually demonstrating and showing us a little bit about this technology. You know me, unless we can have a good time, it's not worth it. So we're going to watch a little video. My students tend to like that. And then I brought a toy today. So we'll start with a video. And here we go. Most of us think of distant wars, but there's a new breed of mini spy plane that may soon be operating in your city, on your block, over your backyard. These tiny flying robots are equipped to take photos and video, and it might not be long before they're a fact of daily life. The question is, what and who are they watching? Here's ABC's Jim Avila. It's an engineering marvel, a pocket-sized hummingbird drone that can hover, do a flip, and transmit everything it sees and hears from a camera microphone in its throat. This micro spy plane is the smallest of an entire new industry of domestic spy planes, soon available to anybody willing to pay, from the news media, to law enforcement, to the weather service, and yes, even realtors. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought we would bring our own little version. Now, I wasn't able to get one of these hummingbird drones, but I went on the internet where you can buy anything, and uh, we had a little demonstration of what I was able to get just uh, for 50 bucks off the internet. And what I want to tell you about it, there is a camera in it. I'm not going to use it today. Um, but there's a camera. You take the disc out of it, you just put it in your computer, and you have the spy capabilities and any of us can do it, including law enforcement. I'm not really good with these things, so I've asked Hamid to demonstrate. And you're here at your own risk. Yes. <laughs> we had a sign out there, so you don't have to sign it. So everyone entering has already like, agreed that nothing's happening. So here we go. Let's see. Like all good law enforcement devices. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> it works out. 
insights on how to find the surface. Uh-huh. I'm really enjoying this thing. Yeah. There we go. Well, we'll get right back to you on that. It works outside. I'm not sure if it's... Look, look, look for it during the lunch hour outside. <laughs> So uh, all I want to do is start by saying that uh, there are actually oh. <laughs> just keep working on it. There are there are people who actually know how the technology work, and that's what we're really talking about today. Assuming that you can get this technology to work, and that I mean I'm giving it one last chance. <laughs> The intelligence community has reorganized and grown larger. There is heightened emphasis on information sharing. And out of those events of 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security was born, where I work. And obviously, the sole mission of that department, or the primary mission, is fighting, counter uh, ca fighting terrorism. The events of 9-11 resulted in the largest reorganization of the federal government there's been since 1947, when the Department of War and the Department of Navy were combined by President Harry Truman into the Department of Defense. The Department of Homeland Security has over 220,000 employees. We operate in every state uh, and every territory of the United States, and we also operate in 75 different countries. Many of our, we have 22 separate com components, some of them with a long and storied history, Coast Guard. We also have FEMA, Transportation Security Administration, one of the favorites we find among the public, uh, uh, and a number of other operational components. What I'd like to do today is take you back up to the 30,000 foot level, or maybe as we've seen in the demonstration, <laughs> the 50 foot level, but talk uh, somewhat about why uh, we are engaged in the activities we're engaged in, and some about the technologies that we do use, and also what we do to do our job as we see it in fulfilling our mission to protect privacy rights 
and civil rights and civil liberties. So uh, going back to what started the department, uh, it's fighting terrorism. That is the cornerstone of what we do. Some of the ways that we do this are visible. Uh, you see them in the airports. Uh, you see them if you come into our land ports. You uh, will see them at our seaports. We are screening uh, people and goods every single day across the United States. But some are not so visible. I think Chief McQueeny can uh, talk to some about this. But the Department of Homeland Security gives great support to state and local governments. And the reason for that is because that we believe the state and local governments are in the best position to uh, assist in ensuring national security uh, and fighting terrorism. So a major priority of this administration has been to strengthen our partnerships on the state and local levels. We do give substantial monies to local governments to purchase equipment and equip themselves in their jobs. And the reason why we focus on those is that we look at the threat landscape and what do we need to be concerned of, concerned about. And uh, today I will tell you what is of greatest concern to the department with regard to terrorism. We are seeing a growing trend of homegrown violent extremism. And when I say homegrown violent extremism, I want to say that I'm speaking as a former prosecutor. We want to get the bad guys. These aren't just people that uh, you may have a disagreement uh, with uh, the way they think. These are people with the intent and the means and the actions being taken to commit harm to the United States. I'm talking about Al Qaeda and affiliated groups that share its ideology and are trying to recruit Americans or to inspire them to carry out attacks. Uh, we are also focusing on smaller scale attacks that are planned in order to minimize the opportunities for law enforcement to disrupt them. You may have seen uh, after the events with the cartridge that was sent uh, through the airlines, and I will say that uh, we are publicly stating that airline security remains a major threat to the United States. That is, they continues to be a focus of Al Qaeda and affiliated groups. But uh, after that, uh, the Al Qaeda in its magazine called Inspire uh, stated that uh, with a $3,000 investment on their part uh, in creating the cartridge uh, uh, that was uh, problematic, uh, they were able to cause major disruption to our economy. Um, so we are seeing a focus on smaller scale attacks that are planned to uh, disrupt us and cause us uh, not only economic but also psychological harm. We are also uh, engaged in a major effort to share our resources with state and local law enforcement to inform them of the threat landscape so they are better able to determine what is happening in their communities and sense uh, what, we, what they need to know on the ground. Let me just say, we remain focused in all of this on the bad guys. We are not focused on the individuals who may be engaged in protected activities, such as expressing political dissent that is not tied to violence. So that's our fighting terrorism. Another major issue set for the Department of Homeland Security is securing our and managing our borders. Obviously, we want free flowing of trade and people across our borders. Just to give you a perspective, one of our components, U.S. Customs and Border Protection officers screen more than 340 million travelers each year. TSA handles approximately 1.2 million travelers each day. The 340 million is each year and 1.2 each day for TSA, and we have nearly 25 million containers coming into the United States every year. So in the past two and a half years, this administration has dedicated unprecedented resources to this effort of keeping our borders safe in terms of manpower, technology, and infrastructure. We've increased the number of Border Patrol agents. We've doubled them since 2004. In terms of technology, uh, which is uh, really the subject here, uh, we have added non-intrusive inspection systems, mobile surveillance systems, remote video surveillance systems, thermal imaging systems, radiation portal monitors, and license plate readers at our borders. These are among our fleet of border security tools, uh, and we are implementing them all 
uh, after they have been uh, approved and vetted by our privacy officer and our Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. We've also added uh, the unmanned aircraft systems. Is we don't call better them than drones. I can't <laughs> comment on that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we ha now have our border on the southwest, and you all are well familiar with this, stretches for 2,000 miles. Uh, and uh, it has very, very terrain on it. So we are using these aircraft along that border. It greatly assists our agents in able, being able to determine uh, if there are illegal entries attempted across our border. Uh, we also have uh, new aerial assets um, uh, on the Canadian border, but our primary emphasis has been on the southwest border. Again, all of this is done in coordination with our privacy professionals that we have in the department. The aerial assets expand our field of vision in places uh, where we otherwise would not be able to see. It also enables us to establish on our border a greater presence, which we believe offer, uh, serves as a greater deterrent to those who might want to enter the United States illegally. And I think our thinking has proven correct because uh, under this administration, seizures of illegal currency, illegal drugs, and illegal weapons are up. Crime rates on the U.S. side of the border have remained flat or fallen. Apprehensions of those attempting to enter the United States, uh, which is actually the best indicator of how many people are uh, illegally entering the United States, fell 53% in the last three years. The amount of illegal alien traffic is at the lowest point since the 1970s. We also are responsible for safeguarding and securing cyberspace. Uh, as you all appreciate, cybersecurity is deeply linked to our nation's economic vitality. Our IT systems are interdependent, they are interconnected, uh, and they are critical to every one of our lives. Uh, we're talking about watching the drone here, an electronic system, our Blackberries that some of us have been using, our financial systems, the power systems, you name it, it's all tied to an IT system. One thing that I did not pre appreciate before I joined DHS is that most of our critical infrastructure, that which supports the United States, is not in the hands of the government. It is in the hands of the private sector. Uh, and so they are in charge of maintaining and protecting those uh, those IT systems to ensure, so you imagine if there's a power failure, and I think you experienced him here one not so long ago, but a power failure across all of Los Angeles County when it's 100 degrees out that goes on for a day, a week, how long, what that effect, what effects that have as we spill out. So uh, the department uh, has uh, tracked as the rest of the government has, the dramatic increase in the number of cyber intrusions on both public and private networks. Uh, they have called into the question the security of the data that's contained on those networks. And a recent study by Norton uh, calculated that the cost of global cyber crime is approximately $114 billion annually. One thing, as I've mentioned, our control over our cyber resources at this current point is greatly divided in the United States. Uh, Department of Defense uh, has uh, control over the dot .mil uh, domain. Uh, Department of uh, Homeland Security has some authority over the dot .gov domain. Uh, but the rest uh, is pretty much within uh, the private sector and, as we said, uh, have varying degrees of uh, protections in place. So we are uh, increasing our efforts. You may be aware of certain cyber legislation that is on the Hill, uh, but we are increasing our efforts to protect those matters that are clearly on our domain, which is uh, the federal networks, as well as we are responsible for assisting the protection of critical infrastructure. So as you can imagine, for a department with this range of responsibilities, and I didn't even mention our emergency response under FEMA, the wildfires, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, those all fall within our department. Or uh, another uh, topic that seems to get us a lot in press, uh, immigration enforcement. So I haven't mentioned those other two duties. Uh, our uh, department uh, cuts a wide swath. Uh, and so 
as you can imagine, uh, we need a lot of legal help. Uh, there is a lot of tricky legal terrain that we need to uh, cover every single day. Uh, and we do. We have over uh, 1,700 lawyers that work in the department, uh, most of them in our general counsel's office, uh, but uh, some of them out in our 22 components. And the things that I want you to know as you hear about uh, what is happening uh, on, from the state and local law enforcement perspective is that um, the issues that we're talking about, surveillance and privacy issues, uh, which are not only in the news, uh, they're also in the courts, um, reflect uh, the changing policy and technological world that's out there. Uh, we recognize that. These tools are important to us. I've described some of the uses and some of the threat streams that we're trying to protect against. Um, but along with that has been a deep commitment at the Department of Homeland Security uh, to make sure that we are protecting uh, privacy rights. We have the first statutorily created privacy officer uh, and that office is to, uh, tasked with reviewing our technology uh, acquisitions, our policies, our implementation to make sure that we are doing our best uh, to ensure the privacy of all uh, citizens. Uh, we also have an officer for civil rights and civil liberties. Both of these officers are presidentially appointed. These are important positions within our department. Uh, and both of them do reviews, both offices do impact assessments of what we are engaged in. So when we look at our methods like watch lists, GPS trackers, and other counterterrorism measures, we have those offices working alongside us to make sure uh, that we are applying the law and following the law as we understand it. It's central to our missions, the missions I've described. One of our other missions is this, to protect privacy and civil liberties. Uh, and so in this new area of cybersecurity, which is new, I think, across the government, it's not so new, but it's uh, definitely a focus right now across the government, uh, the department has already and has long been implementing strong privacy and civil rights and civil liberties standards, and we have employed outside experts to advise us on those. And we adapt when the law changes. Uh, when the Supreme Court in United States versus Jones found the placement of a GPS tracker to be unconstitutional, obviously we took uh, immediate action and started uh, making sure that our uh, shop is in full compliance. So my point in all of this is that we share with you the belief that we cannot sacrifice our civil rights and civil liberties in the name of security. Um, and we uh, look forward to working with everyone to understand what that means uh, in a changing world of technology. Um, the one thing that you have to keep in mind, I've heard the mention that the government has this technology. Well, there are others that have this technology too. Think about the cartels. Think about uh, our adversaries. So it's not uh, just the government that may be uh, perceived as at risk for misusing technology. It's our adversaries as well. And as you think about technology changing, think about also the impact of technology changing. Uh, as it becomes more accessible to uh, a homegrown violent extremists and is more powerful, what does that mean for us as a nation? We don't have the answers to those questions. Those are the kinds of policy questions we face every single day. I'll just put a, as aside, I work on biological weapons of mass destruction, something that's been uh, in the news. So you, and you can think about what is needed if there is a biological weapon of mass destruction. My, my purpose here isn't to scare everyone, it's real, just to set the frame <laughs> of what we need to be thinking about, and I'm a former judge and a former prosecutor, so I just want to tell you what the frame is once I've changed the seat that I sit in. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. But mention it's not just our adversaries who have this technology, but corporations like Google Earth who also uh, have tremendous technological uh, capabilities. So Chief McSweeney, uh, what technology does the Sheriff's Department employ and what, tech, uh, what do you use to try to ensure our privacy? We heard about privacy officers. What, what, what do you, does the County Sheriff's Department uh, do in that regard? Well, um, I may not address uh, the question in the order you might like, but I would like to thank the Fiddler Institute for inviting me. 
Uh, as a rule, I try to avoid lawyer conferences. And, uh, <laughs> I may feel the same way at the end, but uh, Lori asked me, she's hard to say no to. <laughs> so I'm here. She asked me to talk for 10 minutes. I don't want to, <laughs> but I, I will try. I have no particular special wisdom about the Fourth Amendment. Uh, when I have lawyerly questions, I ask uh, my mentor, Steve Cooley, or Joe Esposito here. They coach us uh, very cautiously about how to deal with that. It is a, a constant issue, the new technology. Uh, for a lot of reasons, um, Secretary Hill just mentioned, you know, what are some of the most dramatic ones. I suspect a good portion of this audience is um, concerned and maybe even reluctant about the advance of technology and how it affects uh, privacy rights. I think we all are, but I think some people in the room probably specialize in that concern, and I applaud that. However, as the Secretary hinted but maybe didn't say out loud, I think we all know if one nuclear device is detonated on the United States soil, um, the civil rights and privacy rights of Americans will change forever and not for the good. So I think we need to operate um, with a certain practical uh, thought as we approach this issue, particularly as it relates to that kind of dramatic incident, which frankly is not a fantasy incident. I think the Secretary will tell you that remains one of the great concerns of our country. Uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, be too legalistic. I'm not the guy to do that. I'm really, I think, invited to address this on an operational level. Um, how do the police really do this stuff? What are they thinking when they do certain things? How's the technology affecting uh, our decisions and how we go forward? Well, I will tell you, the police are always anxious for new technology. We want to see things that we can't normally see. We want to know things with greater precision than historically we could know them. And so technology does those things for us. Uh, they often do, it often does it in a way that um, alarms civil libertarians. We're familiar with that. We realize we lose cases with some frequency because we've overreached. But at the same time, we're not going to ignore these tools. We're enthusiastic about what we do. And these tools allow us to move forward aggressively and with great success. So we will instinctively sort of push the limits of what these tools will do for us. And of course, civil libertarians will resist that. And I think that's the fair balance of trade that we, we all work with. And I think uh, overall has a good result for our country. The flood of technology isn't brand new. I think it's been building on us for the last 50 years, I think, in law enforcement. I made a little quick list of some of them. Uh, going back 50 years, you're thinking about things like tape recorders that came to us and we could record conversations. Video cameras came a short time later. We have computer analytics that do all kinds of things and have all kinds of records and privacy implications. DNA indexes, of course, will ultimately allow us to know everything about everybody. Um, we have a new little device some of you don't know about uh, that we call ALPERS. It's an automatic license plate reader system. It's out in all communities in police cars in fixed positions. Reads license plates, so if we want to know uh, where you were last night, we may have a good idea from those readers that can index information for us. Uh, radiation detection is devices that we use regularly. Uh, we don't talk about it too much, but most of our police cars have devices that will actually identify signals. Most of the time they're medical clinics, but you never know when uh, it could be real. And uh, GPS trackers, of course, which is the subject du jour and uh, why we're probably here. Uh, the Jones decision at first uh, caused us to um, sort of stop in our tracks. We didn't, uh, uh, it's not that we didn't anticipate it. I think we figured a decision along those lines would come. But it's certainly been a, a very efficient and effective tool in doing the things we do. Um, we initially believe we might have to vastly expand our human surveillance efforts. Lots of resource questions there at a tough time to have resource questions. Uh, fortunately, we've been successful and gotten comfortable with uh, getting court orders for these and had 
pretty good success. So I think Jones made us, uh, I suppose, more professional and more uh, sensitive to the civil liberties of the issue uh, without really halting what we think is the effectiveness of the devices. Uh, they clearly, these tools have clearly transformed uh, our efficiency and our precision in our work. Uh, we can do a lot more with fewer people and we can be much more exact in the cases that we put together. We know there's more tools to come. Uh, these things are going to unfold very rapidly as we've seen and there will not be any slowdown, I'm sure you'd all agree. Uh, as these tools come out, if the case law isn't clear about how they're used, um, you know, the, the zeal of police, the enthusiasm of police for their work in their cases causes us to use them and use them aggressively until there is guidance that suggests that, uh, you know, we, we have to follow certain protocols. So these tools, I think, you, you know, we will always be pushing the edge and the cases will always be looking at the edge and telling us where the edge is. We understand that. Um, we're going to use these tools um, as effectively and as regularly as we can, and we'll recognize and, of course, honor the decisions that give us guidance and restrictions in using them. We just uh, are not well known for what I'd call technological self-restraint, <laughs> and um, I don't think you should expect it from us. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, in closing, uh, I think you know that the police uh, just, uh, by their makeup, want to know everything about everybody, and uh, um, the system is designed to make that more difficult to do. We understand that, uh, but we don't always like it. I think most of you know that. <laughs> I think uh, the system's built well. The system creates the balance that we all want. Uh, ultimately anyway, between privacy rights and the police need to be effective. As Secretary Hill said, and I'll say one more time, the stakes have gotten, uh, of our success, have gotten incredibly higher uh, in the last 10 years and the risks are incredibly higher. Uh, just because some of the uh, most horrific events have not occurred doesn't mean we should be sleepy about the possibility. And so I'd ask everybody in this business to always consider that when you get too upset with police enthusiasm. Before we go to the Fourth Amendment experts, does that mean prior to Jones you weren't seeking court orders at all for GPS? You know, actually we were almost all the time. There were moments where we did not just because they in our view, they were sort of exigent opportunities and, um, and sought the warrant after the fact, but obviously that's more difficult. And are they warrants that you seek? Or They're court orders. Court orders, so different mm -hmm. standards. Yeah. Okay. So uh, with that in mind, let's turn to uh, Professor Levinson. And given the technology and the issues the previous panelists uh, mentioned, what protection does the Fourth Amendment provide us against the use or abuse of technology since we have to press back on uh, the police officers? Yes. I'd be happy to talk about that, but first I want to thank everyone. I want to thank my dear friend Alice Hill for flying out on a red eye and flying <laughs> right back to be with us today, which is pretty amazing. I want to thank my new best friend, Chief McSweeney, here for coming out, <laughs> and always my dearest friend and supporter here, Sean Kennedy. So. I do want to give you some background on what's going on in at least the law in this area. And I noticed that there are students in any one of them who are in my criminal procedure class could undoubtedly do the same. Um, the big problem is that there's a dearth of direction from the Supreme Court on how to deal with high new technology. I'm not good with technology. I try to be a little better with the law. And if we look at what's been happening, technology is changing very quickly. Uh, but the Supreme Court has not been dealing with the issue so quickly. Back in 2001, Justice Scalia sort of poked fun at his fellow jurists saying, look, we really have to have a legal standard, a modern legal standard to deal with technology. That was in the Kelo case, the thermal imaging case. And he suggested the standard might be when you're using a new type of device, not commonly in the market yet, to see intimate details involving a home then we know we've crossed a line. And then we didn't hear anything until this year when we have the Jones decision. 
And the Jones decision, of course, is the GPS device that's put on not a terrorist car, but a drug dealer's car. And I think that's what well, it's more likely to be used in many situations. And they follow the car, not just for one day, as they did in the old case of Knott's, where the Supreme Court said, when cars are in the public highway, that's open to view, there's no reasonable expectation of privacy. But they monitor this car 24-7 for over a month. And in that, they see everywhere it goes. And originally, they went and did get a warrant but oops, the warrant expired. So on the 11th day, they started their surveillance. Um, the issue there was, was this a search? Now given the precedent before that things that were done in the open were not searches, no expectation of privacy, courts were split on what was happening. And this is the case that went to the Supreme Court. Justice Scalia, in his effort to bring us into the modern times to deal with technology, <laughs> said, well, let's rely on 18th century trespass law to decide this issue. No kidding. And he said that because this was a trespass to put the beeper on the car, this was a search and triggered Fourth Amendment protection. He, of course, didn't deal with the issue that now is before everyone and inevitably would be, which is, what about all the tracking that comes without the placement of a device? The cell phone tracking, things that you wouldn't have a trespass at all, and gives no direction on that. But the concurrences in this case try to address that. Uh, Justice Sotomayor had probably the most important concurrence in the case because she said the day is coming and we have to figure out what we're gonna do. And she starts to talk about what we call the mosaic theory which is surveillance is different now from when the individual officers could follow you on the street. They can collect so much data about your life, and she points out some of the information, where you go to the church, whether you go to the plastic surgeon. I'm just wondering why she picks this one. <laughs> and, you know, whether you go to an OBGYN, all the private things in your life, and to say that we're learning a lot more information, and we can compile it, and we can store it, and we can use it. And that should raise the question about whether we diff should have a different view about the use of surveillance and reasonable expectations of privacy. She also addresses that line of cases that has been used to say that what is used in technology, if we use it and a third party gets the information, like your internet provider, well, so should the police. And she suggests that the old Smith v. Maryland line of cases may not be so applicable anymore that when you give away your privacy to somebody like your phone company or ISP or, or uh, you know, cell phone provider, maybe you didn't mean to give it to the whole world, including the police. But she doesn't decide it. She throws it out there. And then the other concurrence written by Justice Alito basically says, I don't want to go with a trespass theory. I like Katz's reasonable expectation of privacy. OK, this one went too far. But he almost seems to suggest that he needs doesn't think many more will go too far. And we don't know what will happen. That's the legal layout of what we have. And so what we have is not clear Fourth Amendment standards to deal with a rapidly changing technology. And I guess we could say that hopefully Congress could step in and set some boundaries, but I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Lori. Uh, Professor Kennedy, what is the defense bar's perspective on the Jones case? Uh, how often are you raising these challenges these days and how successfully? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, it's a, a real honor to be here on this panel with what I think of as all law enforcement. Uh, you call them bad guys, we call them clients. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoyed hanging out with my colleagues from LADA's office in the back row. I had no idea. DAs also like to sit in the back row, so it's uh, <laughs> all part of the learning experience of the Fiddler Institute. Uh, the, the Federal Public Defender's Office in LA represents everyone from you know, guys who were brought over as small children uh, and deported and re-entered to um, uh, Yemeni nationals detained in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, so you know, we have a broad range uh, uh, of clients, but as someone who spends a lot of time in Washington, I can't help but observe, and it played out today, how often 
the language of national security and terrorism and, uh, enforcement uh, is brought up in the context of traditional criminal law enforcement investigation and techniques. And uh, I think the emphasis on surveillance is deeply related to uh, the blurring of, of terrorism uh, concerns and traditional domestic criminal law enforcement, uh, probably because of money. Uh, you know, governments are short on money, and the one area where uh, uh, Washington seems flush with cash is uh, counterterrorism. So a lot of traditional law enforcement agencies uh, use the language of uh, uh, national security and, and, and terrorism uh, as a way to gain uh, funds and devices and uh, uh, make their arguments for why they should engage in, in surveillance. And, and that's true even in, in like illegal reentry. We hear about you know the border and we have to secure the border. It's true of uh, relatively order, ordinary narcotics investigations. Jones was a real example. That was just a very local narcotics uh, 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 investigation run out of a, a DC nightclub uh, in gangs. And, and so it's just an observation that I think most people who defend cases see uh, in our current era. That said, uh, um, I think the Jones case and other uh, cases, as uh, uh, Professor Levinson talked about, uh, Kylo before it, uh, should give defense lawyers uh, going to the Roberts Court, and let me tell you, that is one tough court for public defenders. <laughs> uh, any PD who's gone up there knows a, a, a friend of mine in the office refers to it as the walk of shame up to the <laughs> US Supreme Courthouse before you argue your case. And those of us who have done it know, know what it feels like. Uh, but even the Roberts Court, <coughs> I think is concerned with how far surveillance has gone and what types of limits are on it. And so is the defense bar focused on litigating these issues? Uh, yeah, I think that actually it's one area with a very, very conservative Supreme Court that we might have some play. In Kylo, you know, Justice Scalia, I mean, Justice Scalia uh, talks about how the technology of infrared imaging directed at a home allows you to go deep into the home, which is the sanctity of privacy, in a way that cannot be done with flashlights or being observance or traditional surveillance, and it basically goes through the walls and tells you things that you uh, could never know without that technology and how, given that reality, there should be some focus on is the technology so invading the reasonable expectations of privacy that there should be judicial oversight. And then when we see in Jones uh, them planting the little uh, uh, GPS device on the car in a, a parking lot in Maryland, uh, the question is, yes, it sounds kind of cranky 19th century, uh, 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 you know, trespass law where he says it's like uh, there's a constable hiding in the carriage uh, all day long because the, the, the GPS tracking it like lets you see in seconds where people are going and I mean that's an example of the surveillance. There were like 2,000 pages uh, uh, of documents showing where Jones was every minute for, for uh, uh, weeks. And so uh, his thing was, this is really different than traditional law enforcement surveillance on the public roads, which is gonna be limited by practicalities, you know, by you know, enough people to do it and how long they can do it. And so I think he said, you know, when you do trespass followed by extensive uh, information gathering, again, it triggers a, a, a search because there is some type of expectation of privacy. And uh, Professor Levinson is right. I, I think it's really unknown and how technology has shaped the reasonable expectation of privacy is a question that comes up over and over again in Jones. In the arguments before the Supremes, uh, you can't believe how many references from the justices there are to the novel 1984. And if it's okay to slap the little GPS device onto the car, is it okay to put it on every license plate <laughs> that the state issues on the car? Or to put a little GPS in a jacket? And uh, uh, the government's argument was, uh, I think, yes, it might be at least as to the parts uh, that when you're walking out in the public, it, it would be okay. And there was a lot of concern and resistance from the justices to that. 
But they do ask the question, is tech changing the reasonable expectation of privacy? And I have a 16-year-old daughter, and I gotta tell you, she's a good kid, but her idea of privacy and my idea of privacy, <laughs> completely different. The, the idea of the things that you put uh, out about yourself on Facebook and who you text and what you say is completely different than, than my idea at 47. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I think those questions are to come, but a couple things that I, I wanna say, I just surveyed, you know, my offices. Uh, you know, I believe law enforcement were using GPS uh, uh, devices extensively without warrants. I'm not sure there's anything wrong with that, by the way, uh, when they were doing it. And there's this other case, which wasn't mentioned, which is a concern, Davis, uh, in 2011, which says the good faith exception for law enforcement uh, goes beyond warrants that are wrong. And if you relied on the existing case law at the time, that's good enough to trigger a good faith exception. So maybe you know some cases where law enforcement didn't get an order at all, uh, will be subject to this Davis good faith uh, exception based on existing case law. Uh, the other thing is uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office claimed, well, this is not going to be such a big deal because we, we always got orders. Uh, again, I, I think that's not completely true. It may be true of s certain federal agencies, but these days everything is a task force, and so there are multiple agencies investigating things. Uh, but they got orders, and they go to the magistrate and they get an order, but the order doesn't talk about probable cause to search, and it doesn't reference the federal criminal rule that governs search warrants and doesn't talk in terms of a search warrant law, and that's probably because, right, if they had all that, I don't know that they, they would be needing the GPS. The GPS is to develop more information to get the, the, the probable cause that they need. So the orders are, are sought in federal court pursuant to an All Writs Act, and they're ill-defined, so I'm not sure that the orders that are obtained from a magistrate uh, comply with Fourth Amendment law, and I suspect we'll see litigation about the inappropriateness uh, of those orders and the judges issuing them when it's not framed as a search warrant order. And the other thing is, of course, uh, when they do seek a traditional warrant, uh, you know, people want to litigate what's said and done in there. Uh, so I think that's um, mostly what I wanted to say about Jones, which I think is a real area for our PDs in the room for us to litigate because uh, it's one of these textually enumerated rights and some of the conservatives uh, actually uh, are going to be receptive to some things we say and as Joan says, there, I think there are 322 million wireless devices out there in the US where they can track you on your phone. They don't even need the, 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 the GPS and I read like LAPD has tested an air propelled miniature dart equipped with a GPS on a little dart well, that, that, beats my thing. <laughs> that enables the officers to shoot the dart and tag the car as it passes. Now that might be like maybe uh, good for like uh, these uh, high speed chases every night on the news, uh, but it raises you know really interesting uh, Fourth Amendment uh, uh, issues. And then like the big producer of GPS is this company right here in California. Um, it's called uh, Telemetry Solutions and their current GPS is 10 grams. It's like 10 grams is like, like, it's like a couple pennies. And so could it go on a license plate or in clothing or something? The answer seems to be yes. But I just wanna end with one thing because there's this great discussion, Lori, today about virtual, virtual incarceration and how letting people out uh, of prison is such a bad idea. But my question is if this surveillance technology has been so effective capturing uh, uh, people who pose threats uh, uh, to our society and putting them in prison. Couldn't it also be used to release people? There are lots of people in prison who, I mean, some are very dangerous and scary, and I agree with the district attorney. Uh, but you know, I've been in every prison in California, and I've met lots of people who there's absolutely no reason they need to be in prison. And if we can engage surveillance to this exactitude, of where people they are and, and follow them this closely, couldn't it be used for more bail options and more uh, uh, release from prison, more diversion, uh, uh, more non-custodial sentences where you could manage the risks that are posed by nonviolent felon offenders uh, and not put them in prison, which is incredibly ineffective and expensive.
when you have a speaker who can uh, kind of combine all the panels together, <laughs> so we can uh, obviously entertain questions on that. Um, I'll start off with one quick question, then I'll open it up since we are running uh, lower, low on time. So I assume, um, I'll go to you, Professor Kennedy, um, to start with, that you would not uh, object to police officers standing on the street watching what's exposed to the public, seeing what they could see. Um, so we know we, there's a difficult line drawn in Jones that Alito alludes to, that there is, at some point, GPS um, positioning becomes a search after a certain point of time, and he also alludes to the fact that it may depend on the kind of cases that it's, uh, that's involved there. So actually, let me start um, with Chief McSweeney. Have you, do you have any statistics from your department on how long your average surveillance is? So maybe we could try to develop some kind of rule. Electro electronic or? GPS surveillance. And on what kind of cases? Um, and then how, and then to um, the others on the panel, how, how would we develop a rule then based on, you know, oh, well, two week surveillance is okay, but three weeks isn't, um, you know, where would we draw the line? Is there any well, such statistics? Uh, you know, narcotics that? cases are the highest volume. Um, kidnap, homicide cases would come in a distant second. Uh, I, I don't know an average, but, uh, you know, weeks is, is certainly um, likely uh, in, in many instances. Okay. So then I'll turn over to our legal experts the other side of that. Do you have, are there statistics from your, your use at the federal level? Uh, I don't have any. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm not in position to share, but I don't have anyone <laughs> okay. uh, anyway, yeah. so. I just wanted to make sure. I, I, I didn't know if you were. Me? Yeah, I mean, should yeah. we reformulate the whole rule about, well, um, about what you're supposed I, to I, 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 I think that that's the biggest problem with and why the court wasn't able to establish a standard in Jones. It's the line drawing issue. And the line drawing issue is a particular issue as uh, concern as you get into areas of working with police officers. Uh, they're really smart, and they come to lawyers' conferences, but they're not expected <laughs> to be lawyers. And so we try to establish standards where they can work it on the street. And that's why I think that the court is sort of drifting a little bit by saying, I don't know how long it should be. And the other thing is, I'm trying to put it together, maybe the chief can address this, not just with these GPS devices, but the fact that there seems to be a camera on every corner. And I wanted to find out if that's true, if that was due to law enforcement, is that private individuals, or have we already become sort of big brother, regardless of GPS devices? Hmm. Um, <laughs> there's not a camera on every corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell us which ones to avoid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the majority of cameras are private cameras. They're all over the place. You most have at least sort of realized that ATM machines have cameras in them and they catch the neighborhood uh, when they're not otherwise blocked. All sorts of, of uh, commercial property has video surveillance, certainly the interior of stores and exterior parking lots of, of commercial locations have them. Uh, we do position cameras at times for various reasons. These uh, license plate reading cameras uh, generally move about in police cars and see what they can see. Uh, they prove very valuable to us. Um, you know, at times we do use camera positioning uh, at certain sites where we expect activity. Um, so they are a tool, a fairly common tool, and um, often valuable tool in documenting uh, criminal activity or the absence of. So, uh, you know, they're a big part of, of what we do, and, uh, and I think people, including police misconduct, is captured with some frequency because of these cameras. So, let me um, see if we have questions from the audience. I have a sign 500 of the GPS for over the last eight years, and there's always ample probable cause. There's never It's not the police cameras that are catching the 
Well, uh, of course, you know, I advocate for seeking a, a warrant, and, and I think you're right, Judge, that when people seek a warrant, uh, uh, they're, they're probably going to get it, which is why I don't understand why there's so much uh, resistance. You know, the administrative office of the U.S. courts compiles statistics and, you know, like wiretaps, which, you know, 90 years ago, the, the DOJ itself said they wouldn't use, now are, are sought extensively, and 3,195 were sought and all but one were granted by judges. So I think if people go to judges and make presentations and they have probable cause, uh, the executive will get it. But in the court in Jones, uh, their position was clear that they ought not to be forced to do that because uh, it is information gathering that is important to uh, create a later showing of probable cause. And I suspect that that is part of the reason why that some of the orders that are sought are not framed as uh, uh, applications for warrants, but are applications for an order of some other kind uh, establishing judicial review. The only problem is I'm just not sure what standard is being used for these all writs orders. You may be more worried about the ones where they don't seek the warrants. Those are the ones we don't Yeah. Yes. Talking about the Jones decision and Sotomayor's comments, um, about redefining the reasonable expectation of privacy, where would we draw the line on a person's personal responsibility? Because that is a private right to them as an individual to protect their privacy. Instead of having the government be paternalistic and having uh, to remove <coughs> itself from information this person is freely putting forward, say the cameras on every street corner, what if we had an officer, if we could afford to, and have the personnel to have an officer stand on every street corner with the view of that camera? Would that be right? Yeah, well, I actually want to address that because I think then the public would be more aware. I think part of the problem is the new generation who A, actually knows how technology works, and B, doesn't pay attention to their privacy. But I do think that there would be a different public response if you saw a uh, uniformed officer on every corner. Now, maybe it would be helpful. Maybe it would stop crime. But on the other hand, people might stop and say, is it invading privacy too much? Our biggest concern is that we're not thinking about it. And the other thing I wanted to talk about, and I don't know whether uh, Council Hill can talk about it or not, is that we have one system to go get warrants and orders, and that's through our domestic courts, our regular courts, but we also have a, a FISA court, a Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Courts, and they're using totally different standards when they're actually dealing with things that supposedly go to national security. So the ones that I'm focusing on are not even the FISA ones. It's the idea that I actually sort of stepped back a little bit when I heard you, like, what should we do to protect our privacy? I think that Katz was based upon the idea that what we do do is we close our doors, we assume that we're not being spied upon, and it sounds to me that people are saying, well, maybe in this new post-9-11 era, we shouldn't start with that assumption. can be held by the carrier, by Verizon, by AT&T, without a warrant. And in fact, they provide a manual to police agencies as to how to retrieve these, which were received without a warrant prior to anyone asking for them. So there, you know, there are some statutes to address some of this. The Storage, Stored Communications Act, which is giving some guidance, although there's debates over that. And that statute hasn't been amended since 96, I think, so. It's mostly email. Right, email. Yeah. But we have, you know, we have this issue where, uh, shockingly, Congress is not dealing with it. And I think that the courts are left to deal with it sort of in a way that asks us to rethink overall how we're thinking about just basic rights of privacy and searches under the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, well, that's the, what Sotomayor raises, which is we can't have the standard where everybody else gets it except for the cops. Um, so I don't know, though, 
if you can, if, when she suggests the mosaic theory, um, whether she's saying that there are certain things that not everybody else will get, right? So ordinarily, uh, your phone provider is not going to sit there and both compile your information and analyze your information. So is there a more realistic way to think of what privacy you've given up? So again, just on that question, but, um, and I'll go to um, Mr. Kennedy. Why do people put privacy rights in a, in a text message? Why should they have privacy rights in a text message? And especially your clients. Send it to a friend. They know that the, a company is involved in that transmission. Yeah. Why do you have an expectation of privacy? Well, I mean, I, I think the short answer is you know, because we have the Fourth Amendment, and the question is, do the fact that you have to rely on uh, a company that you hire to convey your messages to your friends, which are meant for your friends and only your friends, does it somehow waive it? And I, I think these are the questions that uh, are raised by, like, Kylo and Jones, is the, does there need to be some re-evaluation of that because uh, there's some internet study that says, you know, every time you go on an internet, you waive your privacy, right? You have to do, click the button and do it. And if you actually read all the waivers, it would end up being like four or five weeks per year of your time. And so does the court want to put um, form over substance and say, because you send texts to your daughter at school, you've forfeited your privacy because you know someone has to convey that for you? I, I think the answer to that is no. And that's why very conservative justices are saying, do we need to reevaluate uh, uh, the test? And I don't think it's just an amount of time. I mean, in, in Jones, it was trespa trespass for the purpose of information gathering. And I think there was a real avoidance of, of time for that reason. If you would say no, what would your description of what the Fourth Amendment text means? We, we, know, we know from CAPS, they said you have no expectation of privacy. Uh, let's talk about subjective and objective expectations. Mm -hmm. I assume you told, would you totally eliminate the third party doctrine and say you have an expectation of privacy when? Well, do we have to eliminate it or do we have to actually be more realistic and put substance over form and say when a parent is texting a child or a friend, they think that text is private and it's objective because that's the way most users of the technology would view that issue. Statutory protections on that. What I'm saying, though, and this relates uh, to text messages and other things, there is no legitimate reason AT&T needs to hold the text message beyond the time it takes for me to send it from me to my friend. If we need to say the person is on an airplane and it, it stays in queue until it reaches my friend, but they still can and do save the text messages for any period of time beyond that for no legitimate reason. No, well, their reason is for law enforcement. Right, but if the reason is for law enforcement, <laughs> wouldn't that require a warrant, and then are they then becoming part of law enforcement, and they're actually saving text messages without a warrant, and those text messages should be precluded because there is no warrant in existence until one is ex post facto retrieved. Oh, did you want to address that? Well, I, yes. Yeah, I think it's an analogy might be, if you hire a private courier to deliver a letter, a package that's sealed, you wouldn't expect the courier to open the package, stop by their office, make a photocopy, and put it in their file before they deliver it. I think there's a text messages that similar expectation of privacy has been addressed here. 
That, I mean, the, the devil's in the details in every single one of our panels here, right? Because in the Knotts case, that's what it was. I don't think anybody would object here, from what I'm hearing, to a one-day surveillance where, you know, Chief McSweeney says, today is the day I'm going to follow Levinson. I'm going to see, you know, but she's so boring. She goes to law school, she stays, and barely gets home, right? <laughs> but the issue is that technology now says, I'm going to follow her, I'm going to compile the information, I'm going to ask the courier from now on, can you Xerox it before you go? And that's categorically different. And so I think that that's the challenge of technology. It just lets us do more than the individual officer might otherwise do. Yes. Sorry. Um, I'm probably not going to articulate this very well, and if I do, it's not going to be very popular. So it's just a hypothetical thought. This is Fiddler. Go for, for it. The reason that there has not been um, national legislation on the issue is that given the huge, huge volume of electronic communications, text messages, GPS data from phones, the, the massive amounts of information, and compared to that, the extremely limited resources of the, of the police and investigatory agencies, isn't there sort of a, a, a self-limiting factor such that only the people that are doing stuff wrong are the ones that attract the attention of the police. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Kennedy. <laughs> well, I mean. <laughs> that was well said. <laughs> <laughs> what, whatever limitations are on law enforcement, obviously there's uh, uh, the presumption of innocence and, and, and the right to you know, a defense at trial. And um, I, I just think that really when we talk about objective standards and uh, reasonable expectations of privacy, I, I don't believe most people believe that their private communications to their friends or their family are unfolded notes. If I hit reply all on a listserv, I feel like I uh, deserve everything I get. <laughs> okay, Because my email is going to the world and I've made that mistake and many probably of you have. And, and right, you're excoriated for it and you deserve it. And there, it's an unfolded note, I think. You know. But when most people are sending private communications, I think it's exactly what one of our audience members said. I think it's like putting it in the courier and giving it to someone who works for you, who takes money for, from you for the service to deliver it to the person it's intended to. And I, I, well, I just want to jump in with this, which is, the Fourth Amendment was created for situations where maybe the police are not as wonderful as the representatives that we have today. <laughs> uh, we have people today who I trust. I trust when Alice Hill says that she's watching out for me and there's a lot to watch out for. And I trust Chief McSweeney that he's watching out for me as well. But it wasn't so long ago that there would be people, J. Edgars or others, where uh, people might use things in an abusive way. And I think that the, the Fourth Amendment is designed for is worrying about the situation where we can't trust anymore. Um, and that's the presumption under the Fourth Amendment that if we have the expectation of privacies, the courts have the tools to protect us. I'm really worried that the courts, and just hearing the discussion, are struggling for the tools to have that protection as well. Uh, lunch is served in the student lounge. We have a phenomenal lunch speaker. Please head to the student lounge and be seated for lunch. Great. Okay, down here.